happy Wednesday, everybody. Up and Adams in New York City. I'll be back in LA tomorrow. I'll cry about it the whole flight. Uh, today we have Rob Gronkowski. Rob Gronkowski has been everywhere. He's kicking a field goal in the Super Bowl on behalf of FanDuel for you guys. For you guys, what do we mean? We'll talk to him about that in a little bit. Also, Mark Ingram. I, don't, I thought that these were greeting cards for me from the incredible Damon, the incredible producer and CEO of this whole joint that I'm uh, at, but they're not. He made he made red and yellow cards for Mark Ingram. I thought these were, Kay, you've been so great. You only asked for nine granola bars, and you only asked for me to turn the heat up eight times instead of five times like last, or like last time. But um, wait, it is a card. Show starts now. an actual card, is it? I don't want to know. I'm bad at opening gifts if they are. They're not. It's the red card and the yellow card for Mark Ingram. We're going to ask him about uh, a couple plays that we saw on the field. Maybe the last Cowboys play that has everybody going, huh? Jimmy Johnson saying, dumb. He, Jimmy Johnson quote tweeted that play and said, dumb. What does Gronk think about that? What does Mark Ingram think of that? What does Ingram got on uh, Shannon Sharp taking on the NBA in that kerfuffle a couple of nights ago? That's what we'll get into in a bit. But it's Wednesday. What does that mean? It's not just like a throwaway hour. We're not going to do anything. No, we have lots to talk about. We are four sleeps away from finding out which two teams, do teams, are destined to meet each other in Arizona at Super Bowl 57. Which two teams will be interrupting a Rihanna concert out there in AZ? So as we look ahead to conference championship weekend, I want to talk about a few things that I think that we are underreacting to. We always do underreactions every Wednesday, and we're going to hit up a bunch of teams. We will start in the natty because we like to kick that off that way sometimes on this program. And I think, and in fact, I know, I know that we are underreacting to how big the Bengals edition of Hayden Hurst has been. If there was a applause track, I'd hit it right now because he deserves simple love this offseason. Listen, Fan favorite, veteran in the locker room, dresses up like the Will Ferrell and Elf, CJ Uzama, who we know, we love. He leaves to sign with the Jets. That was a bit of a hard one for Bengals fans in a post-Super Bowl loss era to swallow. He was Cincinnati, and replacing him was going to be a bit of a tough task, uh, especially with the front office planning to invest most of their cap in the offensive line and what they needed to do there. The solution, my friends, was bringing in H-squared. Hayden Hurst who, by the way, had the misfortune of playing behind Kyle Pitts in Atlanta, right? After beginning his career behind who, but none other than Mark Andrews out in Baltimore. So this is like, I'm always second fiddle. I'm always the guy behind the guy. Hayden's first shot to really shine, take advantage. We don't know much about him really until now because he was always in those positions. And finishing fourth among tight ends is insane. Lots of tight end play was incredible week in, week out this year. He hauled in, this is more insane, 76.3% of his targets, okay? But the win over the Bills was the icing on the cake, the cherry on top, right? This was a statement, people. Putting up a season-high 59 yards, <laughs> this hurdle was so good. He hurdles his way to first downs, converting four of them on the day. The hurdle kind of kind of is my favorite thing I've ever seen in a long time, though. And then this touchdown that you're seeing, right? He scores this on a sweet little double move to put the Bengals up 14-0. Hurst went off. His biggest performance of the year in the biggest game of the year. So far, of course, and we'll see what happens this week and potentially two weeks from then. Um, because not only is he about to play in his very first AFC Championship game, remember, this is a chance to settle a score. Listen, DJ Reader, don't want to give me any bulletin board material, but you got there's a score to be settled with Justin Reed. There just is. And in case you need a refresher, and I'm sure you don't, here's what Justin Reed had to say leading up to the first game between the Bengals and Chiefs this year, and that was back in week 13. You know, and they have 88 um, Higby. No, it's not, it's not Higby. It was with the Rams. Um, yeah, um, about what's his name? Not Higgins. Um, it is Higgins. Yeah, Higgins. It's Higgins. Higgins. Higgby and Higgins. Higgins yeah. um, they're going to have him back. He's a very talented receiver, too. More of a finesse type of guy. Um, not the best blocker. Um, I'm going to lock him down. You know, <laughs> straight up. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have to come out of the game, like I said, play our best game and go out and do it. In any other week, I would put this to rest and not even talk about it, but because I know that the Bengals are feeding off of disrespect and they're looking for things to feed them, 
I'm going to feed into this just for that reason. Um, the disrespect, he's talking, he thinks he's talking about Higgins. No, he's talking about Hayden Hurst. That's who he's directing all of that, uh, I don't know, what is he about, finesse thing. And here is, Hayden, by the way, has a long memory. He did not forget. Take a listen to this. I laughed a little bit. Um, I don't know. I mean, you could pick anybody in this locker room, but you know, I feel like I'm the last person you probably want to talk about because um, I have a long memory. No! I'm glad Hayden has that long memory because his he wasn't that n noticeable in that game because he got hurt. He hurt his calf and nine plays into the game, and we didn't get to see uh, this sort of play that we saw last week in Buffalo on the field in that matchup. So I'm super grateful. Grateful and gratitude on a Wednesday, putting it out there that we get one more chance on Sunday uh, to see Hayden, Justin Reed, all of that, just or just Hayden. Just Hayden in an AFC title game for the first time that should have no shortage of drama. All right, that's something that I think we're underreacting to. What a good addition. Uh, well outperforming what my expectations were for this Bengals squad and Hayden Hurst individually as a tight end in this offense. All right, sticking with that AFC matchup, I think we are underreacting to something that is weird and will change, likely to change, crazy that it hasn't changed. This is a st statistic. Um, I love Chris Jones. Everybody knows it. Chiefs, he's an all-pro, defensive tackle, 15 and a half sacks. He does not have somehow a sack in 13 career postseason games. This is crazy. This is, it's just weird. There's nothing, there's no bias. This is one of the most prolific pass rushers on the interior that this game has ever seen. Just this season, if you take a look, he finished with, like I said, 15 and a half, most among defensive tackles, fourth in the NFL overall. This made him the first interior D lineman in NFL history to record multiple seasons with 15 plus sacks, okay? And this morning, he was revealed alongside Nick Bosa and Micah Parsons as finalists for the Defensive Player of the Year. Well-deserved. He's an absolute monster, should be feared. And I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for how dominant he's been over the course of his seven years in the league, purely because a guy named Aaron Donald exists and plays the same position. It's kind of like Hayden Hurst playing behind guys. I think he's a bit in the shadow of Donald, and it's not that cool. But Chris really is, if you're looking at his NFL journey, he's probably not worried about this, but, but I'm intrigued by it, he's carving out a Hall of Fame worthy career of his own, right? And these things matter. And that's what makes this weird postseason 13 game drought super strange. So uh, I'm sure he doesn't like that we're talking about it because he talked about it last week. Um, and I don't anticipate any more questions leading up to Sunday because it's going to be hard to top the answer he gave reporters about this. Listen. Oh, uh, I thought you was going to ask the question. <laughs> um. Unfortunately, I have uh, what, 10, 10 to 11 playoff games, no sacks. Um, that's not a huge priority, but I'm going to make sure I get one this go around just to shut you guys up. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about the Bengals side, right? They're motivated. They feel slighted. They feel like underdogs. In this matchup, are the Bengals in that locker room, do they really feel that way? Or are they, they going to let loose a little bit? Like, it's Mahomes, he's not 100%. We've taken care of business against this team, we're okay. Whereas you have a guy like Chris Jones, and I'm talking about Chris Jones as a single game-wrecking player on a, a team that needs somebody to step up because they do have something working against them in this huge game hosting the AFC Championship game. Is this the kind of stuff, not the kind of motivation that's going to make Chris go next level? I think it is. And it's going to be on his mind this week, especially given how how close he came in last year's AFC title game. Do you remember this? Are we kidding? A third and seven, fourth quarter. Jones had Burrow. Oh, 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 so close. Not once, but twice. And Joe, my gosh, this is insane. Oh, oh you got it again. No, wasn't able to do it, okay? Uh, man. He was able to slither away somehow, that sneaky little burrow, and pick up a first down in that one. It was one of the most and more memorable moments of the epic comeback for Bengals fans. So I'm sure Jones wants to erase that this Sunday. And honestly, it's kind of hard not to root for him to just get one uh, and end the narrative. But whatever happens, given all that Chris Jones does to better the players around him on this D-line and everything he's done to contribute to the Chiefs' success in recent years, I don't want uh, you know I don't want to see anyone trying to use this bizarre statistic to define him in any way. It is truly bizarre. Uh, and 
congrats on being nominated for Defensive Player of the Year, Chris. That is incredible. Um, and I hope you take it home. That's amazing. Uh, and we could do yoga in the off-season now on our show if you ever wanted to. Uh, like we did on the sidelines in the preseason. Just saying, lastly, and you guys can tweet up an Adam show. Lastly, I think we're underreacting to the brilliance and the fortunate decision-making of Howie Roseman. He's a genius, okay? I don't know if it's because he won one and it's like almost a Mahomesian thing where we're like, oh, that's crazy. He does a no-look pass. And it's normalized. Like how he makes crazy savvy moves and it's just, oh, we don't care about it anymore. It's watered down somehow. We have to take a second here and not allow that to happen. And it is time to point out what Howie has done with this football team once again. And we want to start with selecting Jalen Hurts. I don't want to take too much time in the history books here, but 2020 second round, we all remember the controversy well, well documented. You have Carson Wentz. What is this? He's never going to be a starting NFL quarterback. What's the point of taking him and putting that pressure on Carson? Don't do this. Well, we know how that has played out with the Eagles trading Wentz away and Hurts turning into an MVP caliber quarterback. So that move in and of itself, brilliant. Beyond the genius of picking Hurts, his selection then opens a door for a masterclass of wheeling and dealing that has built the foundation of Eagles championship roster situations. And let me explain. The Eagles, they dish Wentz to Indy for a first and a third, right? And I'm not gonna get into the minutia of everything about the deal, but how we made a flurry of deals after that involving those two draft picks and flipped them into this. Yeah, it deserves some jazzy music. A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, who's been crushing it this postseason. Are they here without his play? I don't know. The 10th overall pick in this upcoming draft, okay? Courtesy of the Saints. And a 2024 second rounder. Okay, let that sink in for a second. What you just saw there and what I just said, that is a direct result, ipso facto, what so have you, of the Carson Wentz deal. That's brilliant. And if it wasn't enough, he went out this offseason and he stole Hassan Reddick on a three-year deal, okay? Hassan finished second in the league with 16 sacks this year and absolutely wrecked shop in that win on Saturday night over the Giants. They're not here without him. He stole him. Also scooped up, James Bradbury. The Giants cap casualty who played his way into an all-pro nod this season and picked off Daniel Jones in the divisional round win. And he's now the mayor of Shutdown City, according to our very own Darius Butler. How crazy is this? And how he lands the best nickel DB in the game, CJ Gardner-Johnson, in another deal with New Orleans. Saints fans, cover your ears, earmuffs, Nola. I don't want to gloss over the hire of Nick Sirianni either. Like, no, who, who thought that was a great move at the beginning? What? I talked to Boston Scott yesterday. Well, we talked about Nick Sirianni. I'll show you that uh, a little bit later this week. But it's been, remember that opening press conference? The flowers and that stuff that came after that, okay? He's been a home run hire for this organization. One game from playing in a Super Bowl, coaching a Super Bowl. So, Eagles fans, all NFL fans, appreciate Howie Roseman. You are allowed, uh, in my opinion, you guys can tell me how you feel. You're allowed a Jalen Rager, no offense to Jalen Rager, you're allowed a Jalen Rager every now and then when you're able to consistently get on base, score runs, and hit on talent the way that he has. If the Eagles go win another Super Bowl under this regime with a totally different quarterback and core group of players, okay? We need to start talking about Howie Roseman was one of the greatest personnel guys in the history of this game. It is bonkers what he's been able to do. And with all the talent Howie's gotten, comes pressure to cash in this season. I just want to note this because we're thinking about what's on, look, what is up for grabs is this? Is Mahomes a dynasty? Is, he, is Burrow going to be put into the same world as the Mahomeses of the world? When you consider how much pressure is on Roseman, these players, Jalen Hurts, all of in Sirianni, the Birds have nine starters set to hit free agency. I came across this when I was talking to TJ Edwards because I was like, oh man, you're a free agent. I thought to myself, well, shoot, Fletcher Cox, James Bradbury, who I just talked about, Miles Sanders. Man, there are some, t this is a long list, people. There's tough decisions for Howie to make. Let's trust that he makes them well. By the way, is he gonna have to give Jalen Hurts an extension as well? Probably. 
I trust Howie to figure this out, and that just shows you the window that this team is in and the pressure amount. Are you going to have Jason Kelsey? Is he going to play again? Probably not. You're going to have to deal with that next year as well. Um, so there's a lot to get to uh, as we, if, whether or not you're cheering on the Eagles or whoever this weekend. Who do you think Gronk is cheering for? I feel like Gronk and Sirianni would vibe together. Gronk and Nick Sirianni. Oh, don't look so bummed, Rob. Oh no. We'll turn that frown upside down wearing your Dolphins colors. We love it. The old world tight end, the six foot seven three. You can call me to go. Rob Gronkowski. Touchdown! Oh my goodness. Go, go, go. Holy Gronk, I'm holy. Gronk is back, four-time Super Bowl champion, NFL Comeback Player of the Year, five-time Pro Bowler. He's on Fox NFL Sunday, curious about what he'll be doing for them this weekend, of course, for the championship round. And FanDuel Familia. What's up, Gronk? What's up, Kay? I'm just chilling. I'm going to be tame this week. You know? You're going to be tame. <laughs> I'm tame this week. You're getting no answers out of me. <laughs> You, you you didn't say anything insane. Like, what do you mean you don't want to be taped? That's fine. That's fine. You'll make my job more of a challenge. Gronk, you're the best. Listen, you, you seem relaxed. You're you're chilling. I love it. Looks like it's snowing outside your window. But we got the kick yes. of destiny in two weeks, Gronk. How are we feeling? Yes, I do have the I do have the kick of destiny, and I've been practicing a little bit. And uh, let me I'll, I can explain my practice. Uh, in kind of the terminology of, of golf language a little bit. So the first time I practiced uh, kicking the field goal, if you if you translate it to the golf knowledge, I was probably hitting, I was probably shooting a 120 and par is what, 72? Okay. So then the next time I practiced kicking, if you translate that into, into the golf terminology, I was probably about shooting about a, a 105. And now my third time practicing – I'm shooting like a 90. So I got a couple more practice sessions and I got to get myself to par with this kick because then that means I'm hitting it every single time. Are you impressed with your progress? That's really impressive. Yes, I am actually very impressed with my progress. It was very difficult at first, like especially opening up of your hip. I never really done that soccer style before. Every time I've kicked a field goal throughout my whole life when I was younger, it was always toe style. So it's just good good for me to open up my hips like this, uh, trying to kick the ball off side of my foot every single time. So uh, I'm definitely having a lot of progress uh, every time. And uh, it's actually fun to go out there and learn as well. And it's like kind of addicting. Once you hit one, then you want to hit another field goal, then you want to move back farther and farther and farther. Yeah. But uh, the kick of destiny, it's going to be real. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be live. It's going to be lit. Gronk, don't get cute. Gronk, don't get too cute about it. Like, don't, I, we don't need to see you do anything crazy. We do, therapy, I, I cannot tell you how many people tell me or stop me or tweet me, like, there's $10 million in FanDuel bonus bets on the line. Like, Gronk, just show up, kick it, and let's all party. Yes, look at me. Ooh, I look like a beast in that picture. I love it. Woo! <laughs> kick up destiny. I'm right, ready. Sorry. I'm going to do it for America. <laughs> That's right. People are really excited. I'm really excited, too. Um, so and we'll have more information. I mean, I don't even know what's all going down with that. So we're excited to hear about it as, as the uh, the countdown continues here. Fox NFL Sunday. You were on last weekend. You brought all the energy. I think you're, I heard I heard a rumor you're in Philly this weekend. Uh, you know, the, the topic of the day is is Sean Payton. Where is he going? I know you see him in the hallways there at Fox. So give me give me the goods. What's he saying? Is he comfortable wearing that suit every Sunday? Was he, is he coming back to coach? Yes. Yeah. I think he's very comfortable uh, being in that suit every Sunday. I think he has a lot more free time than being a head coach. I know he's been golfing a lot which is great. And uh, I actually love working with him. He's a great coworker. He's a great guy. Uh, his football knowledge uh, is just through the roof. And uh, wherever he goes, I'm sure it's going to be, you know, um, he's, he, well, first off, he's a high demand. Any team that gets him is going to be lucky. Uh, and he's about, I would say there's probably about five options out there. There's five, you know, head coach openings as of right now, something around there. I'm not exactly sure. I know it's around five. So, I mean, I'm sure – you know, you're going to have to throw some serious cash at him. I mean, how can you not? It's Coach Payton. Yeah. You're going to have to make him the highest paid coach for sure. 
And uh, just wherever he goes, uh, he's going to do great, I'm sure. Uh, just just talking to him and just getting to learn who he is, you know, as a guy just at the Fox studio, it's just a pleasure. And uh, he's just going to have success, uh, you know, around him wherever he goes. He's my favorite. I think he's killing it and he can do whatever he wants. And you're so right. Somebody's going to have to back up the Brinks truck and then they got to trade him um, from the Saints. And, and we're here in Carolina, but that's in the division. So you, can you trade your coach to them? I like the idea of Denver. I think Denver... I think they would invest in him. I think he'd have control, which would be great. And it all kind of comes down to Russell Wilson and if he can get something out of him. But, like, Sean Payton sort of has that bravado and mindset, like, I can make that happen again, right? So when you look at, like, Arizona and there's Indy, Indy gets a draft pick, right? They can pick a quarterback. Where do you think would be a good fit using your football mind, not from knowing anything or knowing Sean? Like, what would be a good fit for him? I mean, out of all the teams that you just said with the with the opening of a job of a, of a head coaching job, it it does make sense. It makes the most sense to go to Denver, I believe. I mean, you got the owners; you, you can just throw them a massive contract. Uh, you know, back up those Brink trucks uh, for Coach Pay, and that that's no problem um, in that category. And then he's going to inherit uh, a well coached defense, uh, a team that only lost a couple games by. I don't know, within a touchdown majority of their games. Uh, so mm -hmm. he's got a great offensive mind as well. So he can turn up that offensive side um, of the Broncos, you know, so they can go out there and score some points and win some games. But uh, and also just a football culture as well. I feel like he belongs in a football culture world. And I mean, nothing against like the Cardinals, but like I, I went to the U of A, uh, U of A. Yeah. Um, you know, down the street in Tucson. And let me tell you, like, the Arizona Cardinals aren't the biggest story in Arizona. Like, you know, the fans aren't as loyal as you, I would say, you know, the Denver Broncos fans or the New England Patriot fans. They're all about their team. Uh, in Arizona, I mean, if they're winning, yes, I would say they're about their team. But I didn't get that feel where, you know, they were all, you know, everyone there is diehard fans. I didn't, I never got that feel when I was, uh, at U of A. So therefore, with that being said, I feel like he belongs in a world where, the, you know, where it's football culture. That's what he's made for. Dem the Denver Broncos fan base definitely has that. It's so true. I remember a game you played, and I don't want to bring up a loss, but it was the AFC Championship game, and I was there, and I was up in, like, the last row, worst seats in the building. Why you got to, you know, Nate, bring back that memory? But I'm saying they were crazy. Like, that fan base, that culture was, you know, obviously it's a huge game, but, like, people were jumping up and down in the stadium was shaking, and I don't think people really look at the Broncos and think crazy fan base, but you think they are, and I love that. Yes, no, no, they are, and I love the. I love going to Denver. I love playing, you know, in Denver. Also, you got that little advantage with the Mile High Club, um, you know, going there and, you know, breathing the. <laughs> I think I said that wrong. I'm not really sure, but it was football terminology. I was saying it as in football terminology. So you got to go. You got to be in a different type of shape when you go up there. Is is what I was trying to say, and uh, because of the breathing. You're right, whatever, 5,000 feet up, up in the sky, um, above sea level. So that definitely plays an advantage as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, and then what, <laughs> what else was I saying? I got, I got thrown off a little bit. Know. My dog just ran by my well, office. <laughs> your dog. Well, your dog's in the rest in the rest of this interview. So we'll stay we'll stay tuned with that. So so Bill O'Brien gets hired by the Patriots, um, and I so I got to I got to tell you we looked at some numbers. Me and my awesome production staff, and he was your OC back in 2011, right? That was the most productive year of your career, Gronk. 1,585. These numbers are crazy. 20 receiving touchdowns, 107 receptions. All career highs. Bill O'Brien, and this isn't to say it's because of him, but clearly y'all got it along. He gave you the, put the ball in your hands a lot. So can he restore some of the magic of this and the, the offense that that needs to happen up there with the Patriots? I know you said they need to bring in more talent, but how about Bill? Yes, well, I love Bill O'Brien. I love playing for him. I love the energy that he brings to the table. Uh, he has that niche to get you to go out and, you know, play your best football, to get you fired up, uh, to get you to want, want to go out on the field and get better every single day and make big plays. And uh, it was just a great time uh, when he was here for the two seasons. He was here my rookie year, my second year. And um, he was just 
an awesome football coach um, on the field and off the field as well. His football knowledge is through the roof. And I believe that he's definitely going to uh, restore the Patriot faithful on the offensive side of the ball. And he's going to put his players in the best position uh, to make plays. And he's going to come up uh, with some creative ideas. And uh, I think they're going to definitely improve as an offense tremendously under coach uh, Bill O'Brien. I mean, it was, that's who the Patriots had to get. They had to get Bill O'Brien. That's who they needed to get to, you know, restore to, you know, back in the old days where, where they were at on the offensive side of the ball. And they got their guy. I mean, I'm telling you, they, they I hope they paid head coach money for him because you definitely had to. I mean, he was definitely in high demand, I would say, especially being Alabama's offensive coordinator. But uh, to take him from Nick Saban, I mean, you got you to gotta be paying him the big bucks as well. It's so true, and it's a huge, I mean, even just the spark, like making that swing, bringing in the big fish is huge. And then there's the talent he has. By the way, we crunched further numbers. That year with O'Brien, that 2011 year, that 20 touchdown thing, look at this list, Gronk, just to give you a little love here. You're one of six players that year you became, do we have it? One of six players ever. Gronk, did you know this? To haul in 20 or more catches, touchdown passes wow. in a single season. Look yeah, that, that, that is pretty ridiculous for sure. I mean, I forgot just how epic that year was. It was about 10 years ago. I was 22 years old, uh, just at top <laughs> of my game, which is just pretty ridiculous. And also, I had a rushing touchdown that year as well. So I had 21 touchdowns throughout that whole season. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm just was reminding your- you because you, you, you missed that on the stats right there, okay? 21 touchdowns We got to figure it out. Yes. Was that your favorite year, Gronk? No. Yes, it was by far my favorite year. Like I had like no, like I couldn't feel pain that year. It was like out of hand. Like just it was just ridiculous. Like I had, I was like I had burster sacks on my arm, just like blown blown up. Like I had, my arms were all swollen. Like it was black and blue every single week. I was bleeding through my nose some games, like from my hits and all this. And I just kept going. I just didn't even feel it. And it was just such a great year. That was definitely by far my favorite year in the NFL. That was you, an insane year. Then you went on and won four Super Bowls, um, three with the Patriots, one with Tampa Bay. Uh, this, uh, this, but you think you made news this past week? Your boy Tom, Tom Brady, on his own podcast with Jim Gray, his friend, he had those strong words about you know you've heard it, I'm sure, right? Yes, yes, I heard it. I okay. mean, so I think people, I think people are like. Oh my God! Shot like how could he? Oh, but but I were you surprised by that? Like, what's your take on that? It's kind of no. Whatever. I'm not surprised at all. I I I can't believe it took that long for him to blow up about it. I mean, like you can only get pushed so far and ask that question so many times, especially when you truly don't know what you're gonna do. I mean, I I've, I've kind of you know on the same wavelength. I mean, I'm not as you know not as popular as Tom and I'm wanting to know what he's going to do. But like the first time I retired, wherever I went, everyone would just ask, are you going back to football? Are you going back to football? And like, it would actually drive you crazy. Like after you've heard it the hundredth time in a row um, within like a week, wherever you're going. And uh, then that's when you just start coming up with crazy answers as well. Because sometimes you're not, your mindset's not even thinking about football. You're doing something else. And someone asks you and you just get so thrown off. So uh, it kind of, you know, kind of gets annoying uh, when you get asked every yeah. single second, especially when you haven't even gone through the process yet of what's going on and free agency. The season's not even over. So I can't believe it took him that long to blow up about it. I mean, he was just <laughs> setting the standard of everyone shut the F up. Let me go through the process. <laughs> and I respect it. You know, you got to love it. It's the truth. I though. Do. And I love how he did it on his I- own guy. <laughs> I know. I was like, but Jim Gray was not a phase. Jim Gray was, I, I love how, unf- like, if that was me, I'd be like, okay, we'll go to a commercial. Like, if you did that to me, I'd be like, oh, God, I'd be melting down. Like, I really would. Jim Gray was like, oh, you seem upset about that, Tom. Like, you can't shake Jim Gray. It's very funny. No, no. I was actually on their podcast. Um, actually, we, we shot it the Monday yeah. before the game, and it came out the next day. And uh, Jim Gray, uh, you know, is just smooth sailing. You know, you can say yeah. whatever you want to him, and he's always going to have the same reaction. You can't throw him off, that's for sure. 
Yeah, it was great. And I I will say this just to wrap the the, the Tom thing. Like, I, the only thing that I learned from that clip was he really doesn't know what he's doing. Because I think, Gronk, to be fair, even when, you, when you're, like, stewing over your decision and, like, nobody knows what's going on. Where, okay, here we go. He's back. Um, I'm thinking to myself, well, Gronk knows. Drew Rosenhaus knows. They just aren't telling us, and they shouldn't. But the fact that Tom really doesn't know at this point in time what he wants to do, what his future is, is sort of surprising to me. But everybody needs to leave him alone. Did we lose Gronk? What's that? Hold on, he grabbed his dog. <laughs> we have you. Yeah, we got me. Someone just tried calling me on the other line. It's actually is that Ralphie. Uh, yeah, this is Ralphie. Okay, I love this. So we're gonna we're gonna go into your br brain while you have Ralphie here. We're gonna skip Ralphie, but we're gonna go like we did, Mrs. Frizzle style, into a co yeah. There, he, there's me inside Gronk's head. You never know what's going to happen or where it's gonna get. Um, let's go to Nick Sirianni. Okay, we got these big matchups here. We've got the Eagles taking on the Niners. It's you know you're you'll be in Philadelphia, I hear, which is amazing. So talk to me about that. Um, but when you look at Sirianni, I feel like he's your spirit animal a little bit. I feel like you and him would vibe really well. So let's go inside the, yeah, there he is. What do you make of this? Yes. Uh, he's just being a G. That's what he's doing. Uh, you know, <laughs> I never really heard of, uh, coach Nick Sirianni, uh, Sirianni. How, I'm awful with names, by the way. I'm always, you know, just throwing a curveball whenever I read someone's name at first, but, uh, I never heard of him until he got the, the head coaching job from the Eagles. I still actually don't even know his background, but uh, just seeing what he's done with that program, I mean, and just being faithful to what he truly believed in, because I know he brought a whole new system in last year, um, a kind of a system the NFL never really seen before uh, when he got hired with the Eagles, and he stuck to that system. He brought his players in that he needs um, in order to succeed in this system. And, uh, he's, and look, it, it has paid off tremendously. This year they have gone out and uh, they're just putting up points. Their defense is playing very, very well. And uh, he just seems like a great guy to play for. You know, you just love the coaches that bring that passion and bring that energy that gets you going. And that's what he kind of feels like a Billy O'Brien in a way to where he he yeah. makes he wants you to go out and play for him. And, and you want to go out there and make plays for him and bring that energy to the field just like he's doing. Love it. We're going inside the mind of Gronk and Ralphie as they hang out with us here on Up and Adams. Uh, what about this next image? What's going on in your brain? I heard this podcast. I thought you were truly incredible with Travis and Jason, okay? Uh, the New Heights podcast, it's such a good podcast. Everybody listen. But hey, hey, which, which Kelsey brother gets their second Super Bowl ring first, Gronk? Yes, it was actually a great time when I went on their podcast. They do a great job. They complement each other very, very well. Um, they both bring a, a different dynamic to the table on the podcast. And they're both all pros, which is incredible just to see what they're doing um, in the NFL world um, as brothers. So their parents must be torn whenever they're playing versus each other. That's for <laughs> sure. But who, who's going to get their uh, second ring out of them, too? Uh, I'm going to go whoever has a better chance. I'm going to go with Jason. I just feel like the Eagles have a better chance than the Chiefs. The Chiefs are a great team, but... They got some if if still like you know I feel there's some weaknesses with the with the Chiefs I feel like that can be um, exploited when when uh, when since he's gonna go versus them and uh, and the Eagles they're just a sound team overall on the defense side of the ball to special teams to offense so um, if if anyone gets one I think it would be Jason. We'll see if it happens. We'll get your picks here in a second. Now, here's the next one. We've got just one more, I think. You open up a uh, a Spotify playlist, and it's blank. It's Gronk's dream playlist. The world is your oyster. You're a DJ. What is the first song at Gronk Beach this year? Uh, oh, well, if you open up my playlist, I'm not sure what the first song at Gronk Beach is going to be this year, but we do have 21 Savage as the headliner, uh, which is just going to be ridiculous. It's going to be amped up to a whole nother level. We also have Diplo playing and we also have Lil John playing. Uh, legendary. Lil John has just so many hits. But if you open up my playlist right now, the first song I would say would be uh, My House by Flo Rida. 
<laughs> Is that Welcome true? I love that about you. Welcome to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Baby. Mm, 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 mm. That's, that's good stuff. I love it. Okay, we have two great games this weekend. You sort of gave your thoughts on the Chiefs and the Super Bowl, but they got to take on the Bengals first. It's round four between the two of them. It's in KC. They are weakened, as you said, since the O-line, though, a bit hobbled. What's the determining factor? And make your pick, Gronk. All right, I'm going to go with the Bengals. I think they're going to pull it off. I mean, they're just playing so well together as a team, and they're just bringing that fierce energy to the table. So it's the Bengals. They're not going to win easily, uh, but they're going to win. And uh, what, what, how they're going to win this game is that the offensive line is going to have to play how they did uh, versus the Buffalo Bills. I mean, they finally protected Joe. And it's, uh, it's just crazy what Joey B is doing. I mean, remember how terrible his O-line was his first year as a rookie? And he was just getting, mm-hmm. like, demolished in the pocket. Like, six times a game he was getting sacked. Uh, and he, he had, what, he got sacked and had ACL surgery. And it never put any fear in him. He came back the next year. He didn't care one bit that he absolutely got demolished as a rookie. Imagine that. As a rookie, you're just getting pummeled by defensive tackles. And then you blow out your ACL because you're getting sacked so much. And then you just come back and you go to the Super Bowl. I mean, um, it's just amazing. Uh, Joey B's poise in that pocket and just the poise he has for football. So the O-line, they got to step it up. And if they do, they'll win the game. I mean, you said he reminds you of Brady. He looked every bit of the part against the Bills. Yes, he definitely reminds me of Brady. And uh, we talked about it before. The first time I saw him was in the LSU championship game. And I was just watching the game like, who is this quarterback? Who is Joe Burrow? I mean, the guy's just sitting in the pocket, just super comfortable, just laid back, you know, not not caring. Like, it just seemed like, I mean, obviously caring, but not caring, like, what's going on? Nothing's phasing him. And um, that's kind of the same way how Tom is in the pocket. And just a release as well and just the way he was scanning the field, they just seemed very similar. Yeah, I love it. NFC Eagles, you like them. F- complete team. Niners, best defense. They got a pretty good tight end there, too, in George Kittle. What are you looking at in this game from Gronk's eyes, and who's winning? Yes, all right. I, I think um, this, these are going to be great games. Like, I don't think there's going to be a blowout at all. I think uh, both games shall go down to the final drive or at least the final uh, final five minutes of the games. Uh, but I think San Fran's going to pull this off. I mean, they're just stacked all over the place. Their defense is just ridiculous. They held what they held the, the Cowboys, uh, the 12 points, which is pretty nuts because the Cowboys, they do have a legitimate offense and weapons all over the place. Same with the Eagles, but the San Fran defense is just playing so well together and they're bringing that energy. Um, and they're bringing that physicality to the game as well, especially, uh, with Bosa, and uh, Fred Warner, I mean, just the way that he's playing and getting to the ball, just surrounding, sur- surrendering to the ball, surrounding it every single time uh, they possibly can. Uh, they're just doing such a great job at that. Yes, the Eagles are good, but uh, they're real good, actually. But San Fran is just so well-rounded. And also, San Fran's offense wasn't even clicking last week, and they still won. I don't think they're you're going to go two games in a row without scoring uh, an offensive TD um, in the air, especially you got Debo, you got George Kittle. I mean, you got um, C-Mac out of the backfield. I mean, they're just so great um, at catching the ball and making plays that they're going to have to turn it up this week because they're not going to go two weeks in a row under Kyle Shanahan and not put up touchdowns in the pass game. Oh, my gosh. Philly's such a scary place to play. It's all on Brock Purdy. All right, so we got the picks from Gronk. We'll let you go. You gave all the love to the tight ends. I was going to ask you about Shannon Sharp, but I don't know, like, the details that much because I – whatever. That just looked crazy. Do you see that the footage of that is crazy? It looked I just messy. saw a little bit of it. But, you know, tight ends are making a splash. Let's let's think about this. Look at the, look at every, every Super Bowl team the last few years. You, you have to have a legitimate tight end on yeah. your team in order to get fired. You look at the Chiefs, you got Travis Kelsey. Um, Dallas Goddard with the Philadelphia Eagles. He's one of the best all-around uh, three-down tight ends in the game. And then obviously George Kittle, who is the best all-around three-down three, three down tight end in the game. And then Travis Kelsey, obviously the best route runner in the game by far, probably in NFL history for a tight end. And then... Uh, and then this tight end stepped up for Cincy. I'm pretty sure it was Hayden Hurst. He had a touchdown last yeah. week. And uh, just it he shows. Was crazy you need, good. Yes, you need a tight end in order to win games. I'm telling you, it's an advantage. You got to find a tight end. To all you GMs out there, start paying your tight ends. 
and go find one, even it's, though it's tough. I know it's tough to find a tight end, but you got to find one. <laughs> it's good advice for sure. I mean, Hayden Hurst had a, a ton of red zone conversions, uh, right, or third down conversions. Like, he was insane. He was insane last week, and now he's got KC. There's a safety on the Chiefs that, like, pretended to not know who he was. It was very weird. So they have like, all this, like, drama going into this game. So it'll be a good one. We got your picks. We hope you get wherever you need to go. I know you're worried about weather. So get out there and give Ralphie a big pet from us here on the show. All right. Sounds good, guys. Take care. And uh, did you like my fan duel hat? Thank you. I do. You're a company man, I'm telling you. They, they love you. FanDuo loves Gronk. Uh, and we do too, man. We'll talk to you in a bit. We've got Mark Ingram hopefully getting on the show after this. Uh, we will let Gronk fly, uh, and we'll be back to give other info, other picks, uh, and we'll get into it after this. Big thanks to Gronk. Kick of destiny happening during the Super Bowl. $10 million in bonus bets on the line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm ready for war. I'm destined for greatness. That's went to my hobby that lead. I'm up on the scene. I told you I'm up on the scene. Yeah. I'm ready for war. I'm ready for war tonight. I'm ready. The side of the score. The side of the score tonight. One of my favorite people. I haven't gotten the uh, the old invitation of the Trust Levels podcast collab out in Arizona for the Super Bowl, but I hope it's coming. Uh, he's one of our favorites. I made an uh, Mark Mark Ingram is here. Mark, I made a I didn't make it, but somebody made me a fake red card, yellow card because I'm in New York today. Isn't that nice? All for you, yeah, baby. Yeah. Hey, hey, whatever whatever it takes to get the job done. You know, we know K gonna get the job done. We know the Up and Adam show gonna get the job done. It's the best of the best. So. I'm just, I'm just appreciative to be a part of the family. You're the best. Our Trust Levels podcast, is it coming? What are we doing? Episodes of the Super Bowl? What's the deal with that? Yeah, I think we're doing just like a little, a little, a little parlay session at the, at the NFL experience, oh. I think. I think that's what's going on. I'm not all the way sure, but I know we'll be, be so touching fun. down out there in AZ. And uh, yeah, we would love to have Kay out there, man. We need to have you on the episode for sure. I would love to do that. I want to get into this because I know you're, you're into the off season. You look good. It looks like you're hang, hanging out. You're, you know, getting right or whatever after the season. But I was looking at this, these matchups for this week. The Saints played three of these four teams. Okay. So I need the, I need the information, Mark. You played the Bengals. You played the Niners. You played the Eagles. So put your analyst hat on for me and I'll start in the, the NFC here. How can Jalen Hurts and the Eagles overcome the dominant Niners defense and get a win here? You played these squads. Yes. So first and foremost, you have to be able to score touchdowns in the red zone, not field goals. We saw how tough it was, you know, when you don't when you don't when you don't score touchdowns against San Fran and that and that tough, they're physical, they play they're well rounded all on defense. So when you get in the red zone, when you get opportunities to capitalize on points, you have to be able to score touchdowns. The field goals aren't gonna help you win and defeat this team. So if I'm Philly, I wanna make sure I'm controlling the ball. I want to make sure I'm running the ball, and then I want to make sure I'm able to have explosive plays. And when we do get in the red zone, we have to be able to convert with touchdowns. So that's what I would say is the number one step for Philly. Oof. And for Sam, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You came out the gate with that. I was not, I, 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 okay, church, church of Mark Ingram, go for it. Keep going. Well, okay, no, you asked me about the game, so I'll just, you know, I'll just put my two cents, oh, my little it's analyst great, good stuff. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm glad you like it. I'm taking but, notes. Uh, Okay, okay. San Fran, now when you have Philly, you got to neutralize their D-line. You know, they want to get home with four, you know what I mean? So you have to be able to block their front four with, with your line, you know what I mean? You want to be able to get, you want to be able to get the back out the back out of the backfield, be able to hit them in space. Because mm -hmm. so, they got Miles Sanders, they got Jalen Hurts. So they like to rush with four. They like to rush with four. They like to get home with four. So you got to be able to pass protect. Got to be able to run the football. And, um, yeah, San Fran, I mean, the Phillies defense as well. So, San Fran, that's what they do, though, man. They, they dominate line of scrimmage. They get the ball to Debo. They get the ball to McCaffrey. You know, Purdy be doing his thing, hitting IU, hitting Kittle. Uh, all them boys, they got so many weapons. So, they just want to be able to get the ball to their playmakers uh, safely. Purdy, don't do anything crazy. Just do what you do. You know right. what I mean? You ain't got to win the game. You just got to, you just got to, you know, manage the game. Get the ball to McCaffrey, get the ball to Debo, get the ball to Kittle, get the ball to your receivers. No turnovers, efficient football, and that should put them in a good place to be able to win the game. Okay, 
I'm willing to share you with like Sunday Night Football and Fox and all that, but like that's for the real right there. That was really good information. I loved all of that, and that's why we love having you on the show. Um, I want to ask you about Eli Apple, just because you you know him a little bit, right? This Bengals cornerback, I mean, he cannot he cannot be stopped on social media. He beats the Bills on Sunday. You think that's enough? Like people are always against you, Eli. You had a great game. You did your thing. You played with him, I think, back in like 2018. Yeah. Listen, trash talking on the field is one thing. What's your take on trash talking spilling over on social media and then what Eli Apple is up to? See, I, me, I'm different. I, I don't really like the the talking mess on social media. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a kind of guy to like, if I have a problem with you, I'm going to tell it to your face. Like, I'm going to address it straight on like that. Uh, I'm not a big over the social media type guy. But, you know, there's a new age of, of athletes, man, and they love going to social media for all types of uh, – you know, trolling. And Eli is amongst the top of that right now at trolling. Whoever has anything bad to say about him or anything negative to say about the Bengals or anything regarding Eli Apple, he's going to troll you uh, with the best of them. And uh, I've just seen him on Twitter all this past four or five days, whatever, just going crazy. You know, whoever has, whoever wants to smoke, he he's applying pressure, I guess, over social media. So, um, you know, that, that's not my cup of tea. That's not my forte. But, hey, you know, to each his own. <laughs> are, are we giving him one of these? Hey, you got to yeah. beat him. So he doesn't get a red card because they, they won the game. So if you want him to shut up, then beat his team. Like, <laughs> then tell him can't cool on three. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You're not wrong. Know. A very well reasoned Mark Ingram uh, here in the off season. Okay, let's play our favorite game. It's red card, yellow card. You own a soccer team, and we love that about you. We had the World Cup; that was all really exciting. But now you're gonna, you know, think you're gonna look at some footage that we dug up over the past weekend. Um, I know you saw this because everybody did. I mean, Jimmy Johnson's tweeting about this play. This is the craziest thing. This has to be considered one of the all-time worst plays, right? To, with your life and your whole season on the line, this is what we call. That's a red card, man. Like, like you said, like the, the the coach's number one job is to put your players in position to have success. I don't think there was one player in that field for the Cowboys that was in position to succeed at that moment. What about I mean, Zeke? What, we, had, we had Zeke snapping the ball at center, like getting ran over. Like the receiver goes five yards, turns around, just. Defender drives on a ball, he gets killed. There's no hook and lateral possibility at all. Um, this is a red card for the Cowboys. It's a red card. And then uh, the fans, do we have this? The fans did not like the play call, right? Can we, do we have that? Ah! Did you see this? Yeah, I seen that. <laughs> I, seen some, uh, I, was, I seen something on Twitter where it was like, everybody in the back had to have binoculars because the TV was so small. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, man, uh, red card. What are we doing? I mean, red, red card. card. What are I we mean, doing? now you got to buy a new TV. It's probably not his house. He's probably just visiting. I mean, <laughs> come on, man. Come on. What are we doing? Okay, next one. Uh, I don't know much about the NBA, but I know that you love to take in an NBA game from time to time. This Shannon Sharp thing, I don't know enough about it. But Lakers Grizzly, it gets heated. Uh, Dylan Brooks, I guess. I don't know much about this. What? Did, who gets a red card? I mean, Shea gets a red card for show. I mean, just you all feet on the wood. Like, just enjoy the game, man. Like, what are we doing? I don't know. But the players was hot. Shea was hot. Shea apologized for his actions. So that's much respect to Uncle Shea. But come on, dog. Like, we on the foot. We on the wood. Feet on the wood. We having a great time. Just enjoy the game, man. Let's not get into a confrontation with the players, man. I saw a lot on Twitter about how Shannon Sharp could take on the entire NBA and everybody should leave Shannon alone. Do you agree with that? Could, would Shannon come out on top against every NBA player? I think Shay might handle the business with all of them. I don't think they want the problems, <laughs> for sure. But, you know, basketball players are a little different, you know. But, you know, Shay was a tight end. He was in the trenches. So I had to lean Shay Sharp on that. We love it. Mark Inger, we appreciate you. We'll talk to you next week. We'll see you in Arizona. Uh, and great analysis today. That was amazing. Salute. See you. Peace, love, trust levels. Woo, woo, woo.